today Aaron will be talking about is classical liberalism still relevant in the 21st century? And our second speaker here is uh, Peter Katzenbarnas, uh, MLA, the member for Hillary's in the Legislative Assembly. He's also the Shadow Minister for Police, Road Safety and Industrial Relations. Uh, Peter's also been a lawyer for the past 25 years, and today he's going to speak on uh, reason and politics in the era of populism. And Aaron, you'd like to start? Just bear with me, I only wrote this this morning. Uh, my speech is actually um, reason and uh, politics in the age of populism. I think uh, uh, Peter's got uh, classical liberals in the 21st century. Uh, since the days of Socrates, civilization has honed the art of reason as a tool to solve problems, be they personal, moral, or political. But all too often, as David Hume observed, reason is subordinate to passion in the modern world of politics that can lead us to demagoguery. It may be surprising to hear this from the mouth of a small party politician, but populism is seldom, if ever, the answer to the problems with which we wrestle. More often than not, it is the very thing that exacerbates them. One nation goes beyond appealing to the xenophobia of the average Australian and has adopted the Malthusian ramblings of crackpot socialists like Dick Smith. Aptly named, Dick Smith promotes the myth that we're running out of land, food, and water due to overpopulation. Pauline Hanson and Dick Smith have joined together to push this outdated idea. Thomas Malthus, philosopher, in 1798 predicted that unchecked population growth would lead to famine and disaster. While the population has grown from 800 million in his time to 7.5 billion today, uh, Despite this population explosion, food is more plentiful than ever than it's ever been in human history. Modern agriculture sees many countries export their produce, and GM and even lab-grown foods are paving the way to meet the needs of an ever larger population. Food is so cheap that obesity is a health problem among the poorer communities in the developed world, which is an incredible problem to have, considering most of human history was a subsistence lifestyle out of the hand to mouth in agrarian societies. Now, these prophets of doom aren't limited to one nation. Now, they also exist within the Greens party. The Green Malthusian isn't driven by xenophobia. They are driven by something far more insidious, climate alarmism. The uglier, anti-human side of the Malthusian fallacy. While one nation would reduce population growth by restricting immigration, Greens would do so through population controls, like increased access to abortions. Now, that sounds like a recipe for eugenics, but you may not be wrong. Balthus said drastic population controls were needed to avert disaster. He claimed that the positive checks of higher mortality were necessary to bring the number of people back in line with the capacity to feed. The Greens advocate for a woman's right to have an abortion, arguing that women ought to have bodily autonomy. But no one, uh, no one else can tell a woman how she can, what she can or can't do with her own body, even if there is the life of an innocent third party involved. In true populist fashion, this idea of bodily autonomy isn't applied consistently. Self-ownership, and therefore the ownership of private property, isn't just rejected by the Greens, it's actively opposed. A woman may own her body for the purpose of reproduction, but that same woman ought not smoke, or drink alcohol, or vape, according to the Greens. Neither may she work for a wage that the Greens don't approve of. The advocacy for bodily autonomy, autonomy is only applied so far as it can win votes within a niche demographic. This inconsistency is also evident within One Nation, who all too often you, you'll hear One Nation and Peace rail against socialism and Marxism. All the while they support state ownership of industries and oppose privatization. One Nation wants to create a government-run bank. They oppose deregulation. They call for industry protection. These are all big government central planning policies typical of a command economy. Both the Greens and One Nation's policies lack any internal consistency because both parties lack a coherent political philosophy. Instead, they rely on their appeal to a simplistic sense of fairness and justice. Most importantly, both advocate policies that have been tried before and have led to disaster. The central planning of the Soviet Union and of communist China led to the deaths of hundreds of millions. 
and subjected their citizens to lives of abject poverty. The populist policies of one nation and the Greens are a tragic departure from the Enlightenment, the legacy of the West, which at least one nation likes to invoke, is one built on Athens and Jerusalem. It's a legacy of Greek philosophy and Judeo-Christian morality. The Enlightenment, so romanticized by populists on the right, gave birth to liberalism, a philosophy of liberty, personal choice, religious freedom, freedom of speech, private property, and free markets. These radical ideas of freedom led to the Industrial Revolution, and over the last 300 years, have been the driving force behind the flourishing of mankind. The almost elimination of poverty and hunger in most parts of the world has been thanks in large part to personal liberty and the free market. But while we have inherited the culture, customs, and, institu and institutions shaped by the Enlightenment, they are constantly chipped away at by demagogues and autocrats who reject reason and the lessons of history in favor of the passionate appeals to emotion. It isn't just the Socialist Party of the Greens or the Socialist Party, the National Socialist Party of One Nation that engage in populism, but it's also <coughs> the major socialist parties of the Liberals and Labour. While Labour borrows heavily from Karl Marx's Guide to Red Lights, it isn't their communist rhetoric that does the most damage, but rather their pandering to conservative voters. Labour's so-called local projects, local jobs program is neither job creating nor is it local, <coughs> as there are constitutional obligations requiring local procurement to include anywhere within the Commonwealth and New Zealand. But it didn't stop the government wasting almost $40 million on a vote buying slush fund. In an effort to one-up the Liberals, Labour has adopted and implemented mandatory sentencing, never mind that this erodes judicial discretion and has no measurable impact on crime. It appeals to populist sensibilities about crime and punishment within the electorate. In a battle to see who is toughest on crime, both major parties have supported eroding our civil liberties. Our rights, many of which were secured through bloody civil wars and revolution, have been legislated away with the stroke of a pen. The right to privacy, the presumption of innocence, legal professional privilege, the right to self-defense, freedom of speech, freedom of association, all have been eroded either through the direct action or the complacency of the Liberal and Labour parties. You might expect so-called progressives in the Labour Party to discard tradition in the name of progress. But is it too much to ask that self-styled conservatives protect and preserve the institutions that we inherited? It seems many conservatives value political expediency over integrity. For example, just recently, Tony Abbott has changed his position on the Paris Climate Agreement again, for the third time. Does, this, does he now support the Paris Climate Agreement because it is consistent with his, with his conservative principles? Or is it merely because polling and warring our shows voters are concerned about climate change? The path of least resistance for many parties is to abandon reason and adopt populism for easier electoral success. Fortunately, some of his voters keep supporting feel-good, emotionally charged policies. Political parties will have an incentive to continue pushing the same disastrous policies. We must insist on our elected representatives upholding the principles that founded this country and this state, lest we trade our birthright of liberty for demagoguery. Before I start, can I ask a show of hands? Who is aged in this room? Who is aged over the age of 30? And who is over the age of 40? Okay, so it's about 50 50. Because I'm talking about classical liberalism and whether it's still relevant in the 21st century. So certainly us over 40 remember the 20th century, particularly the last parts of the 20th century. But for the young people, the people under 30, the 21st century is your century. So it's really important to all of us, but it's particularly important to you. Now, classical liberalism means many things to many people. <coughs> so, when you're talking about classical liberalism, it is important that perhaps not providing a definition as such, because we'll always debate that, 
but putting a ring fence around what we're talking about. So when I refer to classical liberalism, I refer to that long strain of critical thinking that emerged in the 18th and the 19th centuries that places the individual, places each of us at the centre of society and of life. The rule of law is the basis that defines rights between individuals and in limiting the role of government. And classical liberalism, when it sprang up, it, it drew from previous uh, thinkers like Adam Smith and Hobbes and the like. And it really placed economic freedom, capitalism and free markets at the very core of classical liberalism. At the same time, so too, at the very core of liberalism, are uh, inalienable rights of human beings, such as individual liberty, freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association, and the like. And I actually think it's those two tenets that come together, the economic and the personal, or social if you like, that come together to make classical liberalism. And where we get into trouble is where we separate the two, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So for me, I'm talking about both those strands running together at the same time. Now, people of my vintage, we certainly remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. We celebrated. And the, the wall fell in 1989. That precipitated the collapse of the Soviet Union and its satellites. Uh, we saw that as a triumph of individual liberty, of capitalism, and of free markets over what we know are the evils of collectivism, personal oppression, and socialism. And it's fact, it's indisputable fact, despite what the Greens or other parties might say, that the end of the Cold War ushered in an era of unbridled prosperity in both the Old West and the Old East, to use those outdated terms. That prosperity was driven by radical economic reforms, the encouragement of free trade between nation states, and the heavily increased freedom of individual movement across the globe. Uh, so that's, that's really critically important, the free movement of people, as, as they sought both freedom and opportunities. Here in Australia, we're still enjoying the benefits of that uh, triumph of freedom. We have lived through possibly the greatest sustained period of prosperity in the history of the modern world, almost 30 consecutive years. But where are we today, just a few months away from the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the fear that my generation grew up with of imminent nuclear war between East and West? Well, as everywhere I seem to look, the principles of classical liberalism and more importantly the benefits that that classical liberalism brings for us are all under attack. Individual liberty is challenged by a loud and obnoxious global movement trying to suppress free speech, attack the rule of law, and entrap anyone who dares to buck the new orthodoxy in never-ending lawfare. And they do that in the guise of discrimination laws and these things, so-called positive rights. Really, all of that is just a smokescreen to attack freedom of expression, freedom of thought, individual liberty. And we've seen people like Mark Stein and what they've been through. They've been dragged through the courts, guilty until you prove otherwise, um, and, and there's many examples like that. Scarily, opinion polls across the world, including here in, in Australia, show that young people are actually considering socialism as a real alternative to our capitalist system, or even our hybrid system, because we're not in a totally capitalist system, unfortunately. So despite 30 years of unbridled prosperity, People are thinking, maybe so, we should give socialism another go. And it's happening at exactly the same time as we're seeing the horrors of socialism actually play out in front of our eyes when you look at the once prosperous nation of Venezuela and what the people of that country are going through right now. A lot of you either have been or are at university, you know that they don't even pay themselves to free speech anymore. They create safe spaces to shield people from new ideas. They hound speakers out because they don't hold the politically correct view. Uh, students are often counselled, in inverted commas, uh, if they vary from the expected new orthodoxy. 
And some students have even been physically attacked with very little uh, done to protect them just simply because they got different legal views. And look here in Australia, what have we seen in the last week? Uh, the government joined in that oppression for a while. Thankfully today they reversed their decision. But my legal novelist was initially asked to please explain why you want to come to Australia and why we shouldn't keep you out. Uh, I'm, I'm glad sanity has prevailed in that case. I mean, he's not everyone's cup of tea. He is a provocateur, but he expresses a legitimate view and in a nation like Australia, for our, our government to basically become Antifa for the day and say, sorry, you can't even come in. Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a low blow and, and it's another indication of how freedom and classical liberalism are under attack at every, uh, at every stage. So none of this is good, but I know there are a lot of voices out there including many people in this room that are prepared to stand up and argue in favour of liberty, free speech generally, and liberalism. Where my real fear about the future of classical liberalism lies is in the area that I spoke earlier of economic liberty. Uh, we do laugh at silly ideas like guaranteed income, especially that recent silly idea by that AOC woman of a guaranteed income for those not willing to work. But we can dismiss those, perhaps they're real outliers, but look at the bigger picture. The massive gains from the reduction of tariffs and increasingly freer trade across the world over the last 30 or 40 years have been immense. Lower employment, lower inflation, huge increases in wages and salaries, and a massive reduction in poverty that Aaron also spoke about, particularly in poorer nations that have actually embraced economic liberty. These gains should be celebrated. Instead, they are on the brink of being wound back by a retreat from economic liberty to the old order of competing economic blocks. Old Europe, you see what they're doing with Brexit. They're fighting a very strong rearguard action to deny the people of the United Kingdom the opportunity to leave the closed economic shop and unleash the benefits that will flow to them from embracing free markets and free trade with the whole world rather than just dealing introspectively with Europe. In the, United Nation, in the United States, which theoretically is the bastion of capitalism, we're seeing an erection of new tariff barriers. I'm personally not convinced that they're anything more than a short-term bargaining chip, and I hope I'm proven right. But if I'm wrong, the consequences will be dire. Less free trade certainly always means slower economic growth, lower jobs, lower incomes, and sadly, more people being condemned to poverty. But we haven't helped ourselves in Australia here, either. It was the focus on free trade and the massive economic reforms of the 80s and the 90s that have driven our three decades of economic prosperity. In the past few weeks, however, we've seen the Australian Labor Party threaten to reverse a free trade agreement with Indonesia that will clearly benefit both nations. It's clearly not the same Labor Party that championed things like floating the exchange rate, deregulation of financial markets. And um, look, the coalition government haven't been great at it either. Um, and I, I know I'm short on time. So what, what can we do to keep classical liberalism relevant to future generations? Have we had too good for too long? Perhaps. Um, is it because we don't teach history in the schools anymore, particularly about the 20th century and the evils of capitalism and socialism? Perhaps two. But I think one of the other reasons that we've got, and this is my critical point, is that somewhere along the line, that direct and inseparable link between liberty and prosperity has been lost or forgotten. There are free speech warriors, they'll fight for my life, they'll fight for all sorts of other things. There are some economic warriors who fight for free markets and economic liberty. But how often do those voices come together and argue a coherent argument around classical liberalism? We're separating ourselves. Yes, there's the IPA, the Taxpayers Alliance, all of you people here today, and some of, what, some of the old fossils like me from the 80s and the 90s. But the challenge really is for everyone to stop separating the concepts of personal freedom and economic freedom and just concentrating on one or another. That way, we can ensure that the benefits of classical liberalism are enjoyed by future generations and that we fight this creep backwards to a more collectivist, more totalitarian state. We've tried the alternatives, they've been utter failures. 
again and again and again. So we shouldn't cower or retreat in the face of the enemy. We need to regroup. We need to focus on that inextricable link between liberty, personal liberty, and economic prosperity. And I think we'll get to that stage. And I remember when I was in university in the 80s, I used to wear this T-shirt that had a slogan on the back that said, free minds, free markets, free societies. And let's keep fighting for that, because at the end of the day, that's what liberty is about. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Peter. And I'll open the floor to questions. Peter, when I was uh, served as a commissioner, a lifelong commissioner here, we were in charge of the uh, issue, basically the report that had to be produced regarding domestic violence and restraining order. And as a matter of fact, I was very clear to the then Attorney General that that law would undermine due process of law and the principles of natural justice. And I know that some people have lost completely access to their kids and property rights have been violated as a result of this terrible piece of legislation. Don't you think that in many ways you have to start re-educating politicians to have some regard for principles of the rule of law and natural process, due process of law? Do you think that we should think about uh, uh, when it comes to voting voting for people like you and me who are doing a good job and see if we can put more people, like-minded people, to support your cause so we can have more classical leaders in Parliament doing the right thing. Look, I mean, that could be a topic that we could speak on for hours. There's a few people in this room that could. Uh, I totally agree with you, Augusto, that we have a generation of people coming through all political parties that are far more interested in the redistribution of the spoils of being elected that are actually there to achieve anything. And I want to use as Exhibit A and Exhibit B two recent Prime Ministers, Julia Gillard and Malcolm Turnbull, who both were far more interested in becoming Prime Minister mm -hmm. than having any coherent vision for what they wanted to achieve when they became Prime Minister. And that filters right through the ranks. But yeah, it's probably a topic we could have a whole conference on. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I'll take Carl next. My question's for you, Peter. That's the first time I've heard you speak. Uh, I'm really surprised because you sound like a reasonable guy, a classical liberal. Uh, how do you, how do you, I guess, or do you struggle with the moral dilemma of being a classical liberal and then having to toe the liberal party line, which at times is very much anti-classical liberal? Oh, look, uh, it's not hard for me because I sort of run to the beat of my own drum. And I've been around forever. I was a member of parliament in Victoria. Um, the then Premier used to say I was his most effective opposition leader, even though I was on the same, in the same party. Um, I don't think it's that dire. I think at the end of the day, when you scratch the surface and you talk to your colleagues, often you find that those ideas that we're speaking about at this conference are there. They're just subsumed by some of that retail politics and that populism. Um, was it better in the 80s and 90s? I actually think it was. Uh, and again, why we've got from where we got to to now, I, one of the major reasons is complacency. We've had it really easy. Um, I was at university living through the Victorian Depression of the late 80s. Uh, there was no complacency there, let me tell you. But it's not the only reason, and some of it is to do with the fact that those people, like I said with Augusto's question, there's a cabal that's taken over all political parties, particularly the main ones, that really could have been in either party and their philosophical their philosophical framework doesn't exist. Um, could you? Oh, I might just add in on that last point. I've observed um, members, current members of parliament, former members of parliament who um, for example, are very conservative, would probably be at home in the Liberal Party, but have run as a Labour candidate because they know their seat is a safe Labour seat. Uh, and, and vice versa, they're very progressive people in the Liberal Party because they, they're running a very safe sort of seat. Um, uh, I, I think that's very disappointing. I think um, uh, maybe the major parties have a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, how you address that is very difficult because the 
incentives are there for people to, 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 to seize power um, and to use it once they've got it. Uh, there are very few incentives for politicians to um, uh, to give up their power uh, and, and to, to provide people with freedom. Um, so how we address that is the, is the key question. I don't know the answer yet. I just don't want to try this out. Yeah, we um, talk about the rise of millennial socialism. There's um, an argument to be made, a very strong argument, that a lot of millennials have had a very raw deal under the system that we usually find ourselves defending. Uh, West Australian today is reporting a youth unemployment figure of 11.2% of the nation, 14.5% in the state. Um, there's a widespread problem with housing affordability and the ability of millennials to actually be able to afford houses. And maybe controversially, for this drone. But there's a widespread belief that climate change will be a significant threat to the future prosperity and security of Australia. And that centralised parties have been inconsistent and failed to confront that problem adequately. So my question is, um, as facts are liberals in state parliament, what policy do you believe that we should be pushing to be able to deal with those problems and bring the money back to the problem? Yeah, look, um, read somewhere, uh, someone else's opinion, that um, millennials perhaps aren't as socialist as they think they are. Uh, that, that their understanding of socialism is not really real socialism. They, when you explain socialism to them, you know, forced redistribution of wealth, uh, uh, things like that, you know, the, the abolition of private property, that they actually don't want that. Um, they think of socialism as this sort of nebulous, sort of abstract idea. When you when you get down to the policies, they're, they're actually probably more capitalist than we think. Um, that being said, uh, what policy can we push to convince people that socialism is bad and that you know, a more liberal, classical liberal view is good? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, the, I think, uh, for a start, um, probably one of the most catastrophic policies uh, implemented in, in my time is the payroll tax increase. Uh, at a time when unemployment was at about 5% in WA, the Labor government brought through a payroll tax increase. We already had the highest payroll tax in the country. Uh, we increased it further. Um, uh, and now unemployment is at 6.9% plus to um, So, so uh, unemployment keeps going up as payroll tax is staying high. Uh, I think a reduction in payroll tax will show immediately um, uh, that uh, you know, reduction in tax can spur economic growth and that <coughs> tax activity get less of it, uh, which is pretty simple <coughs> until people start feeling it in their hip pockets. I don't think they'll learn that. Um, talking about populism, <coughs> unfortunately at the time, uh, that uh, the payroll tax came through in 2017, the payroll tax increase came through. Uh, the Liberal Party supported it. Uh, they voted with the government to increase the, the, the payroll tax, um, uh, which I think was very disappointing. Um, so at that time, uh, it was myself, I think, One Nation, maybe the Shoots and Fishers, uh, and the National Party that voted against it, which was a weird sort of alliance of people who were arguing for a free market. Um, but, um, but, you know, I think until uh, uh, we also need at the same time, you know, sort of these. these Supposedly liberal or high school parties to sort of you know remember their roots and get back to their basics um, uh, and start voting consistently um, for the values that they espouse. Look, you know, that's fine. You you touch on three really important topics for millennials, where if you're looking for governments for solutions, it's definitely going to get worse. Uh, payroll tax, as Aaron said, um, that happened in the upper house in our place. wasn't even put to the vote um, in the lower house. If there's one thing I want to achieve in politics, I may not achieve, but if there's one thing I want to achieve in politics more than anything else, so I want to smash payroll tax, just get it off the books. Uh, it's a job destroying tax. All taxes are bad, that one's particularly bad. But there are other things too, around minimum wages and, and opportunities for young people and traineeships and the like that we need to start talking about. But prosperity, economic growth, attracting new jobs to this state will drive down unemployment. Nothing else will. Otherwise, all we're going to be doing is shuffling it around, getting rid of some older people, replacing them with younger people. We've got to grow the pie. And we've got to have that discussion. Housing affordability, absolute disaster. We've been shielded a bit from it here. I have two adult kids who live in the East. Let me tell you, I know about housing unaffordability. Planning laws, ridiculous taxation laws, and trade union control of any construction project over three storeys. And they're trying to get into residential housing, single story housing as well, adds cost upon cost upon cost upon cost, and climate change. Look at the ridiculous debate we've been having for 20 years on climate change, right? 
Is it real? Is it unreal? Or is it whatever? Why don't we de debate about what is the best measurement for the impact that humans are having on the planet? Get that measured and then unleash the free market to come up with solutions, just like the free market has come up with the solutions that feed people and alleviate poverty and hunger and malnutrition. It wasn't central planning that did it. And you reckon if climate change is an issue and if there's changes that have been caused by human activity on Earth, governments aren't going to solve it and collectives aren't going to solve it. Only markets will, but we've got to move that debate to that space to let them let markets and entrepreneurs and people do it. Okay, we've got time for one more question, Renee. Um, just referring to your comments about you know that we've had 30 years of prosperity and, and we see the government coming out a lot saying that we're we're still in theory in a period of economic growth. However, I don't know if you saw there was an opinion piece by one of my colleagues, uh, Daniel Wilde. Um, if you look at it right now, the only thing that's really means that the government can claim an economic growth is that we continue to increase immigration. Um, and that if you look at it at an individual level, we're actually in a recession and have been in a recession since about 2010. Um, and you can see that in the lowest end of living that I think a lot of Australians are experiencing. And that's not to say that immigration is a bad thing. I just think that right now it's being used as a way by the government to cloak what is actually a very poor economic outcome. So I just wanted to know what you thought about that. It's, it's a twin-edged sword, because if you go out into the economy and you talk to some uh, workplaces, there's still a massive skill shortage, an absolute massive skill shortage. I think what we've done, and, and I can be, I've never, I, I have no filter. Uh, I have no filter, and some of your colleagues uh, will know that, and they've known me for a long time. Um, we've dumbed our people up. We've dumped kids up. We've given them rubbish, bullshit degrees, bullshit qualifications that don't get them anything. At the expense of providing them a real opportunity to have a stake in the future of this country by training them properly. Why are we importing more labour? Because we need it. And the other thing we did, and this is going to be ultra controversial, in that big spate of immigration that took place in the last decade, the, the noughties or whatever, We've brought in a lot of really highly skilled people. And what we've ended up is with a nation of job stops. There's a whole range of jobs down at the bottom that no one actually wants to do. You try to get an Australian kid to aspire to be a manager at McDonald's or KFC, you can't. That's why they've got to continue to employ. You can't pay someone, well, literally, you cannot pay them to sit there and aspire to do that. Coming on as a trainee, be an assistant manager, become a manager, eventually maybe own your own store and become a multi millionaire No, not attractive. So I, I don't have a solution to it. I've read the research. This concept of uh, per capita GDP uh, reducing is relatively untested, but it's, a, it's an alarm bell. No doubt about it, it's an alarm bell. Whatever we're doing has been great, but isn't as good as we think it is. I think that's your point, and I think you're right. Um, uh, I, uh, I I haven't looked at Daniel Wilde's piece yet, um, uh, so I don't have a view on it. But the idea that uh, immigration is obfuscating uh, uh, sort of an economic decline is really concerning. Uh, I also worry that it gives more fuel to, to sort of anti-immigration, you know, political parties. You know, to say, oh, it's just a Ponzi scheme. Cut immigration, it's bad, we're only doing it for economic growth. I mean, for the most part, I don't think, I don't think governments are intentionally employing people to hide poor economic figures. It's probably just a byproduct. Um, but it is important that we do have immigration. We need, we need a, a free flow of labor and capital, of course, um, to continue growing an economy. But that's not the only thing we need, obviously. We need, uh, we need stable laws, we need stable government, we need, uh, we need low taxes, we need low barriers to entry, we need to cut red tape. Um, so, you know, the, the obfuscation of poor economic growth by immigration is uh, sort of helping distract us from these other things that we need. Uh, is the answer to cut immigration? I wouldn't think so, but we definitely need to look at the sort of economic fundamentals um, and sort of ignoring them, you know, um, uh, thanks to our high immigration. Can you put your hands together for the year of